Also at the State House today, a bill introduced that would end a more than 60 year ban on children playing pinball in our state. People weren't glued to their phones 24 7 in the 70s. Children actually went out to play. All that activity prompted some bizarre laws in the U.S. Let's explore 25 weird things that were illegal during the 70s and 80s. Number 25, playing pinball under 18. Many people who grew up in the 1970s and 80s would remember playing pinball, even if they were under the age of 18 years old. This was mostly played in sub shops and bowling alleys and is something that you definitely wouldn't see happening today. It wasn't until 1976 that pinball was legalized as before that, Pinball was considered to be a game of luck and very similar to gambling. Remember one of these bad boys? The Black Knight was notorious among kids in the 70s and 80s for taunting them when they would miss a shot. Many would also call the 70s and 80s the golden age of pinball as the earlier machines were very basic with weak bumpers and flippers. Some of the more recent machines are gimmicky with convoluted rewards. The Gorgar in the 80s was a favorite among many. It was like a shotgun blast of heavy metal fantasy for a little kid and people are still fascinated by pinball to this day. Number 24, driving with open beer in your hands. It would still blow many people away nowadays that people in the 70s and 80s were able to drive with an open beer in their hands and buy cigarette from public vending machines. It was a pretty standard practice for them to stop at the gas station to put 75 cents in the vending machine for a pack of cigarettes. Some kids would be sent by their fathers to the 7-Eleven to buy cigarettes. Most police also did not care much about having a beer while driving unless you were rampantly wasted. Senator Todd Rutherford, on Tuesday the bill was In Texas, one could open carry legally and there were drive up windows at liquor stores. In the early army days, there were beer vending machines in the barracks too. If you ask some of the old boys today about their teenage years, they would have some really wild tales of stupid things done in the 70s and 80s while driving with a beer in hand like moving friends' cars onto railroad tracks and waking up the next day in another part of the state and not knowing how you got there. It's a miracle they live to tell about it. Number 23, Lawn Darts. An outdoor game for the family to help expedite an answer to the age-old question of whether or not the afterlife actually exists. Lawn darts were a fun but dangerous game played in the 1970s and 80s. Some mad lads back then would throw it over the house and try to land it in the circle. While this seems like fun, the newer generation nowadays would never have it. It was extremely dangerous. And there was always that one kid, who probably never reached adulthood, that would throw them straight up in the air. They would stand in a circle and throw them straight into the air, then whoever chickened out first and ran was made fun of. It is insane how kids in the 70s and 80s were not allowed to play with horseshoes because the shoes were heavy and the children could hurt each other by throwing them around. But lawn darts, they could play with them all day. Number 22, police ticketing for driving with a loud exhaust. In the early 1970s, police officers stopped and ticketed people for driving with a loud exhaust. The old muscle cars from the 70s had engines that were loud and had that perfect rumble to them. Takes off. The officer gets in his car and follows her on a short. They were great for drag racing, but even at an idol, that rumble is just one of people's many favorite sounds. Though the police, for some reason, did not like the sound of that and would ticket anyone they said had a loud exhaust. Whenever cyclists would get together in groups, one of their chief complaints was how many tickets they got as a result of their exhaust, which would get some people confused about thinking about a group of road cyclists farting up a storm. The main problem was that it was up to the officer to determine if the vehicle was too loud not an actual measuring device, so even stock cars and bikes were being pulled over. Number 21, smoking on airplanes. People who flew in the 70s and 80s would remember one of the first questions being asked while boarding was, smoking or no? This was because there were actually separate sections for people who wanted to smoke in airplanes, and it was legal to smoke in the non-smoking section. Thus, it was common among friends to book a seat in the smoking section. The smoking sections in airplanes were basically bars in the sky. Though some airplanes had the smoking section at the back of the non-smoking section and almost the entire plane would reek of stale smoke, that is why at the time, this insert meme sign actually served a purpose. There were ashtrays built into each armrest too. Even though smoking was made illegal in the 1980s, almost every other naughty kid would try and fill them up with bubblegum. Sure think of everything, including our Winstons. Mmm, tastes good. Later, when smoking was banned in airplanes, people would often sneak up to the bathrooms to have a smoke which is another reason why we still have ashtrays, especially in bathrooms, to safely dispose of it. Number 20, cursing in public. In the 1970s, it was illegal for people to cuss in public. The cops could actually arrest people in Florida for cursing in public or using foul language in public. Even if someone would cuss at their wife, they could be arrested. Supposedly, this was to protect women and children from hearing such language, but some women got arrested for cursing in public as well. 
That law was repealed, but if you were yelling and screaming and you refused to calm down, or if a police officer warned you repeatedly to calm down and you didn't, they could arrest you for disorderly conduct or disturbing the peace. Cussing was definitely a sign that you had lost control of yourself, which was something bad. Some groups of people were known for having saltier language, like sailors. But most of the time, resorting to foul language was looked down on as a sign that you lacked personal restraint or the intelligence to express yourself properly. Number 19. Drinking cocktails during lunch People nowadays would remember their parents in the 1970s drinking cocktails and other drinks during lunch, even during business lunches. Oftentimes, people would get home from work and make cocktails for the family. They would have a cocktail or two each evening before dinner. This was throughout the 70s and into the 80s, even as the cops actually started arresting people for DUI in the 80s. The three martini lunch used to be a big thing too. This worked when one had a lot of middle management with not a lot to do. People would just enjoy their job more if and when they could drink cocktails during lunch. Lots of homes had little bar rooms in their basements, along with all the accoutrements like cocktail napkins, glasses for different drinks, a sink, and a refrigerator. Then that stuff went underground. The bottles were kept behind a cabinet somewhere and there wasn't the variety there used to be. Number 18. Buying Dynamite Buying and selling dynamite was illegal in the United States of America, though it was still common to use it to remove tree stumps. In fact, buying and selling dynamite was so common, many people wouldn't even remember if it was ever illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Some stores stopped selling dynamite in the early 1970s, but others persisted. Then in the mid-1970s, one could buy a $5 federal license and purchase dynamite from registered chemical plants. Some used it to blow up beaver dams that were destroying the land near their cow pastures. Then in the 1980s, the feds started to tighten down. You could still buy blasting material, but you had to just fill out the equivalent of the yellow form. After that, things got harder, especially if you weren't a contractor or agriculture business, like having proper liability insurance and being able to transport it properly. This would keep the average Joe away. Some municipalities would require additional permitting or licensing. Number 17. Spanking Children Spanking children in schools, including with paddles, was also weirdly common back in the 70s and 80s, even though it was illegal. Some schools in the late 80s had a policy that when a student would get whacked, or suspension, and if they took the paddle, the school wouldn't tell the child's parents, which somehow seemed normal at the time. Some schools even had a two-sided paddle, the smooth side for the girls and the knurled side for the boys. There was also a huge paddle with holes in it, which was typically used if a child was being particularly naughty. Such spankings were used to discipline children in school, and sometimes were even encouraged to the schools by the children's parents. However, it just makes the situation worse, as it negatively affects children's emotional control and makes them more aggressive. Number 16. Child Labor Child labor, which back in the 70s and the 80s included children working in industries, was unfortunately common in the olden days. Children working on farms was common too, like throwing hay bales onto a trailer. Nashville, Tennessee, this is George Christopher, who works in Postal Telegraph. He's 14. And then unloading them to be put into a barn and then stacking them in the barn. And the arguments to maintain it range from nobody is forcing them to, but if we ban it, our industries will no longer be competitive, and when they work, they're not on the streets. This is an actual example that we must always keep in mind, because many of these arguments from the so-called choice to competitiveness through to the false alternative are still regularly used today to justify practices that are morally reprehensible. On the other hand, it is often ignored just how dependent poor families were on child labor. After all, farming families had worked together at all ages for centuries. So the arguments against criminalizing it came from many of the poor as well. And the orphans would need state care after getting them out of the factories. So that would cost more too. All these and more realities were stacked against it for a while. Number 15. Taking guns to school In the 1970s and 80s, it used to be common for students to have a gun rack in their truck. Heck, some schools had a skeet shooting team and it wasn't uncommon to hunt before school, then clean the firearm in the shop during study hall. Though, it can be said that if students are being trained properly and are vetted beforehand, it could be a good and safe hobby. Kids used to bring their hunting rifles into the school, check them into the principal's office for the day, and pick them up after school so they could go hunting in the forest surrounding the school after school. Whole pile of guns in the principal's office. You may have heard stories from your grandparents about leaving their hunting rifle in their locker at high school. They would also then leave early or skip some classes they didn't like to go hunting and then come back later in the day. Number 14. So much pollution. People used to change the oil on their car and dump it down storm drains or pour it into a hole in the ground. Old bottles of pills got thrown in the trash. So much aerosol hairspray. Commercially, we dumped so much chemical waste into rivers they started catching on fire. 
started burning through the ozone layer. Super fun sights. The list goes on and on. Here's a real life example. Watch the unbelted woman on the left fly across the cab, slamming. Smog and other types of environmental pollution were all over the news in the 70s and 80s. They used to have to issue smog warnings in Los Angeles during the weather segments of the TV news when they expected stagnant winds and smog build up. Those days, the sky would be completely gray, and you could actually taste and smell it in the air. Nashville had terrible smog issues too in the 80s. Nashville is in a basin, and in the late 1980s, the air would turn yellow in the afternoon and smell like rotten eggs. Number 13. Cars Without Seat Belts It was common to find cars with the rear seat belts not even fitted in the 1970s and 80s. Oftentimes, if people really cared for it, they would separately buy seat belts and then fit them onto the car themselves. Raise your hand if you spent road trips as a child lying in the back window or the folded down back seat of the station wagon. Then put your hand down and take your ibuprofen before your shoulders lock up. In some, if not most states, you could not be pulled over just for a seat belt violation. You must have been pulled over for some other motorist offense, and then they could additionally ticket you for a seat belt violation. It was often pretty fun and exciting to chill in the trunk area and pop our heads out occasionally to look around and wave at the people behind us. Number 12. Crossing a Border Immigration controls are quite a new thing. Before we had extensive public services, nations didn't bother with border controls. Nowadays, one has to remind themselves that when crossing borders back in the 70s and 80s whenever they wanted was not normal and actually quite a privilege. Before 9-11, crossing the U.S.-Canada border was a rite of passage for people who just turned 18 to go with their friends across the border and hit up the bars and nightclubs. You just drove over the bridge, the driver would show their ID to the gate guard and be on your way. In South Texas, some people used to go across the border every Saturday after church for lunch. They didn't need a passport until the 2000s and would just walk across. Some also used to go to northern Maine every summer where they were kids and crossing the border was like crossing the street. Back then, they didn't even need a passport. Number 11. Burning trash in the backyard People from the 70s and 80s would remember everyone burning leaves in their backyard. We even had special garbage cans with perforated holes. Dad would take their cigarette lighter and start the blaze at the bottom and then start stuffing leaves into the can. Some would burn only paper trash. They would use old food as fertilizer for his garden and get trash pickup once a month for metal and plastic. They did pay money every time the trash picked up their trash, so they did not have to do it every week. Usually a family would accumulate a lot of trash. Every couple days, they would take out the trash, bring it down on the property, put the trash in a big metal burn barrel, and light it on fire. Aerosol cans, plastic, milk jugs, and everything would go into that barrel. Usually the chore would circulate among the kids. People would often set their garbage on fire in their yards to get rid of it. However, this caused a lot of problems. The smoke from burning trash polluted the air, making it hard to breathe and causing health issues. It also created a strong, unpleasant smell that bothered neighbors. The government decided to make burning trash illegal to protect the environment and people's health. Instead of burning trash, people were encouraged to use garbage collection services. This way, trash could be properly disposed of and managed in a way that didn't harm the air or people's lungs. Making it illegal to burn trash in the backyard helped keep the air cleaner and healthier for everyone. It was also an important step towards better waste management and environmental protection. Number 10. Carrying a pocket knife everywhere in the 1970s and 80s, it was very normal for people to carry a pocket knife or multi-tool daily. It was as common as wearing a wristwatch or carrying a pen on you nowadays. Sat against something for years and been affected by that. This knife uh, doesn't look as closely matched. Most people who would carry a pocket knife did not think of it as a weapon but as a tool. Need to cut up an apple? Pocket knife. Need to cut some tangled string? Pocket knife. Don't have a flathead screwdriver? You guessed it. Pocket knife. Usually, people didn't take it out with them if they were going out drinking or to an event where they might be searched. But that's mostly because they would not want it confiscated by doorstep and or denied entry. Mostly, the Swiss Army knife was popular among boys in the 70s and 80s, and it was a very useful tool too, especially when opening packages. Number 9. Ugly Laws The Ugly Laws, also known as unsightly beggar ordinances, were laws that targeted poor people and disabled people and deemed it illegal for any person, mutilated, deformed in any way, so as to be a disgusting object, to expose themselves in public. The law was only abolished in the late 1970s, and throughout most of the 70s, the laws were enforced to some extent. It has to be made clear that they weren't for people who were simply unattractive, though. They were for people with disabilities. They were intended to solve the problem of disabled homeless people distressing our fine citizens by panhandling and occasionally used to keep our fine citizens who had visible disabilities from entering your shop or restaurant and upsetting the decent people, which is very disturbing. 
In some states, these laws weren't enforced at all, just like slavery in some southern states wasn't actually abolished, but just wasn't followed anymore. Number 8. Tire Swings Here kids, here's a dirty, greasy, nasty old tire with thinly sharp pointy bits of steel sticking out of it. We hung up from a tree for you. That way, if we ever have to move this to another tree with a higher limb, we have plenty of rope. We can just untie the knots. Oh, and it's been collecting rain in it too. Have fun! Kids of the 70s loved tire swings, and we would make our own in the backyard with old discarded tires. However, tire swings made from real tires were banned in the U.S. due to safety concerns, as they were a breeding ground for insects and mold, making them a health issue. Though some had a drain hole to prevent the nasty puddle, these tires were not only used for swings, but also for a crazy yet dangerous ride down the hill. One of us would get inside it somehow while another kid pushed you down the hill. Nobody thought anything about seeing three or four kids walking through the neighborhood with a truck tire. Number 6. Driving with a kid on your lap Most people who were kids during the 70s might have fond memories of sitting on their father's or mother's lap while they were driving. Sounds like fun times, right? If you were caught doing that, you would be behind bars long before you could explain what made you do it and why you would put your children's life in danger. With no special car seat for infants and no seat belts in cars, it was common for moms in the 70s and 80s to drive with their kids in their laps. Even infants were placed on mom's lap whenever there was a trip to the hospital in the front seat with no restraint. Car seats in the 70s weren't really designed to protect kids. They were designed to keep them from crawling around the car. Seat belts, at least in the front seats, became mandatory equipment in the late 70s. It didn't actually become mandatory to wear them until a decade later. So even if it had a proper child seat, there would have been no way to secure it to the vehicle's bench seat. Laws were made to protect kids and make cars safer. Car seats were invented to keep children safe during rides. These special seats have belts that hold kids securely in place. Wouldn't it be great if traveling with your baby becomes totally hassle-free for you and super awesome for your baby? Just like grown-ups use seat belts. By making it illegal to drive with a kid on your lap, more people started using car seats. This helped reduce the number of injuries and saved many lives. Today, it's normal for kids to ride in car seats, keeping them safe while traveling in a car. Number 5. Spitting on the Sidewalk In many states during the 1970s and 80s, spitting on the sidewalk was illegal. This public measure aimed to keep streets clean while reducing the spread of disease, as spitting was considered both unhygienic and disrespectful. Authorities hoped that by enforcing this law, they could improve public cleanliness and maintain higher health standards. Violators would face fines or penalties, making it clear that such behavior was unacceptable. The law was part of a broader effort to maintain public order and hygiene, reflecting societal concerns about cleanliness and health during that era. Beyond being a minor offense, spitting in public was seen as a significant public disturbance that needed to be controlled. This measure also mirrored broader public health campaigns of the time, which emphasized the importance of personal responsibility in maintaining communal health and hygiene. The enforcement of such laws underscored the societal commitment to creating a cleaner, healthier living environment for all. Number 4. Asbestos People who work construction in the early 80s have all kinds of crap in their lungs. This is asbestos, which was found in plaster, floor tile, siding, among other things. There were minimal health safety laws as nobody warned us about the dangers of this material. This is why those DIY home renovations that people do on TikTok scare us. No one ever wears a respirator or other PPE, and they're doing a full demo on a 100-year-old plaster wall. The same physical structure that makes it so useful for building applications also means that it breaks down easily into a fine powder of needles almost too small to see. We will never forget the quote of a drunk man who could barely speak English when he was pulled over on cops and the cop tried to use a breathalyzer on him. The cop kept getting mad at the guy for not blowing and his response was, the asbestos killed my blow and he was not kidding. If we could see how the poor patients feel, they feel like drowning 24-7. This is because the fibers they inhaled make microscopic cuts in their lung tissue which turned into scar tissue. Scar tissue prevents the lungs from absorbing oxygen. We can't imagine how big of a disaster it was, but there still was no awareness about it. If this is interesting to you, you may find that the asbestos industry is still alive and booming. Number 3. Wearing Shorts In the 70s and 80s, it was quite terrifying to be tossed into that holding cell for wearing shorts. It was considered obscene to see people's ankles as it was considered the equivalent of seeing nipples. We remember being called unhygienic and obscene when we wore shorts. There is this story where a guy was visiting his mother dying in a hospital and they would not let him in because he was wearing shorts. They stopped him in the stairwell and turned him around. There is another funny story where a lady came to New York City from Germany and was stopped by the NYPD and sent back home to change into something decent. Even the people who would work in factories in crazy hot summers were ordered to wear dress pants. 
If some of them rolled up into a tank top or a t-shirt with the sleeves ripped off and board shorts, others would look at them with an appalling look. Number two, feeding pigeons. Feeding pigeons was a highlight in a nice family trip. The people from the 70s and 80s would remember what it was like when it would rain lightly and you'd be walking across the square on this skating rink of oily pigeon crap. The time when the pigeons show up is starting to change now because of the sun, the seasons. We were glad there was no more pigeon crap after it was banned, but a moment of silence for those who unknowingly would bring pigeon food and get chastised. It's much better now not having to deal with a spiv in a crap-stained coat selling moldy seeds and being able to sit down without too much worry or eat anything without a lice-ridden bird going for your face. Not to mention, pigeons have more fatal diseases on their feet than an entire sewer rat. Unsurprisingly, there was a whole Save the Pigeons campaign and the seed sellers were very angry, talking about history and tradition and how no pigeons meant no tourists. We felt bad for the seed sellers, but somehow they shifted their jobs. By making it illegal to feed pigeons, the city hoped to keep things cleaner and healthier. If people fed the pigeons, they could get in trouble with the police and might have to pay a fine. So even though many people liked feeding the pigeons, they had to stop to follow the new rule and keep the city clean and nice. Number 1. Tattooing in New York City this is Thomas Edison's electric pen, which is a precursor to the tattoo gun. In 1961, it officially became illegal to give someone a tattoo in New York City, but Tom DeVita didn't let this new restriction deter him from inking people. The day after it was put into law, the tattoo artist quietly opened the doors of his tattoo shop in Alphabet City, then one of the grittiest neighborhoods in the area. He limited himself to just five clients per day, working late at night when many other people were asleep. While these may seem like temporary measures for such a vibrant city that seldom sleeps, it wouldn't be until 1997 that it would finally lift the ban. Going into Tom's home studio was like the next level for me. Like I'd seen his tattoos, I had seen... People who got tattoos felt like rebels. They liked the danger and the excitement. Tattoo artists were like secret wizards creating magic with their needles. But it wasn't all fun and games. If caught, both the artist and the person getting the tattoo could get into big trouble. It wasn't until the late 1990s that tattoos became legal again in New York City, letting this hidden art finally come out into the light. Do you think we missed something crucial from the 70s and 80s? Let us know the bizarre laws you encountered. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.